But here's another seven points of how to avoid an identity of crisis. If we have no sense of who we are beyond our daily roles, then we will experience a continual state of identity crisis. But the good news is it doesn't have to happen. One of the ways you can avoid an identity crisis is to ask yourself the following questions and sit with them for a while, don't do them quickly, and make adjustments where needed. So the first question is, who are the people you're attached to for your sense of worth and identity? Who are the people that speak in your ear and tell you who you are? I'm just rephrasing that because who are you attached for to for your sense of self-worth and identity? Number two, what are the things or places you use to identify with? What are the things or places you use? Now there's a place for traditions, but we may all know somebody and you might be one of these people where we've got to take a vacation to the same place every year because we have so many memories. And that's part of how we identify ourselves or this particular home or this town. It, it holds memories for us and that's helped shape us into who we are. So we go to those places. We spend time in those places. Number three, how much do your possessions your job, your money, or your image impact your self-worth and identity. I just get done telling you that I could go by if I, when I have to without a box of hair dye and without some lipstick. Do I want to get by without them? No, but I'll be all right if I have to. I'll just be a little homelier. <laughs> um, they don't define me. They're just tools I use in my life. How much do these things define you? Number four, how much do your physical looks, your health, or your strength impact your self-worth and identity? It does come a time, folks, when things start to droop and sag and wrinkle and lose their elasticity. <laughs> We're all going to age. And if you have valued or placed your whole identity on your looks, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. Number five, how much does your local church or denomination impact your sense? of self-worth and identity. Number six, how much does serving the needs of others impact your identity? Some of you are servers and you just wanna do for people all the time. What happens when you can't do for others and you need somebody to do for you? I have a mother who has spent her entire life cooking for other people and she cooked well and she was very generous. She's at a point where she needs some people to cook for her. That's not going over so well. And she still tries to say, I want to take somebody some banana bread or I made a roast. She can barely walk, but she still wants to serve. It's a good thing to care about others and do for others, but what happens when you can't anymore and you need to be helped? How smoothly is that transition going to go? And the last one, number seven, how much does your performance or intelligence impact your sense of self-worth or identity? If you're known for always being a problem solver, being smart, being wise, what happens when nobody really cares how much you know and they don't they're not asking anymore and then just think about it on a scale of one to ten how much do these things impact your self-esteem and identity this is a little homework assignment for you and the lord 
Just remember, every one of these things is fleeting. Every one of these things represents a role we have played, a memory we've come to cherish, or a price we have paid. These people, places, and things played a part in shaping the way we see and interact with the world. But none of these things gives us our identity. They are merely a means of expressing our identity. Our work, our activities, and our relationships are basically just the way we fill time. They keep us busy. And when we're busy, we don't have to be alone with our thoughts. For many people, the thought of being alone or of being quiet too long is terrifying. But what happens when you can't escape the stillness? The years change us all. And you and I will continue to evolve until the day we die. We are not the same people we were 10 years ago, and we will be different still 10 years from now, if the Lord allows us to be here. The clock does not stop for anyone. Time marches on for all of us. Wrinkles will appear and beauty will fade. Strength and he health will not last. Influence and image are fleeting. Death will eventually call for each of us. But who we are at our core remains. The spirit that possesses us will guide us until the end. For followers of Christ, the call and the purposes of God remain true from the beginning to the end of our lives. What a tragedy it would be to live our entire lives and never discover who God really created us to be. The bottom line is we were created for God's pleasure. We were created to worship him. We were created to carry out his purposes on earth during a very specific time in history. The works of our hands and our mind are meant to be an expression of his. We were formed in his image. We have value, worth, and dignity and acceptance because God said we did. He's recorded it in his written word for every person throughout history, for you and for me, for everybody who's lived and is yet to live. God said we have worth and dignity and value. So instead of letting my work and my community service and my relationships define my identity, I bring who I am. I bring the core of me, my purpose, my gifts, my abilities, my mind, my talents, my humor, my quirkiness. I bring those things to everything I do and every relationship I have. And I remember talking to a group of Christians one day in a church years ago, and the question was, how do we live a Christian life outside of Sunday in the four walls of the church? That just boggled my mind. That said so much to me. I said, what do you mean? How do you do it outside the four walls? I don't know how you not do it outside the four walls. If it is who you are, if you are a born again, transformed Christian, how do you not bring that to everything you do and every interaction you have? How do you hide that if it's who you are? And if you've got to find a way to do it, then I would beg the question whether it's authentic. If I choose to believe who God says I am, instead of listening to other people, then I'm not going to feel shaken or fearful when my abilities are gone, my physical strength is gone, my relationships are gone, my looks are gone, or my job is gone. I'm not going to get rattled. Will I grieve and feel it? Probably yes. But it's not going to rob me of my peace because my identity and my purpose is not found in those things. What would happen to you in the quality of your life if you had this attitude? My work, my looks, my possessions, and my relationships are nothing more than an expression of me and the presence of God in my life. You know, I say a lot of things to a lot of people and I can use colorful language when necessary. But I'll tell you what, at the end of every conversation, people know the presence of God in my life. 
what if people just knew that God was just with you and you walked in that and you knew who you were, not in arrogance, but you just settled within yourself and that everything else you do is nothing more than expression of your identity and God with you. It would be the beginning of feeling good about yourself in spite of what others might be saying or in spite of the stressors that are happening at work. You would not feel fearful or shaken. You see, the question is not, who am I because of my work, my health, my money, my image? The question is, who am I in spite of these things?